I think Seattle is problematic. It characterizes itself as being progressive. Sometimes I think we're a little more progressive in our minds than we are in reality. That characterization sometimes makes it difficult to have honest conversations. There ain't no single institution in this country that black people is not being impacted by, whether it be our education system, our criminal justice system. We're, we're not immune from issues of racism in Seattle. The relationship to people who are black, whether East African or African American, is the core problem that we face. And that shows up with the police. It's tragic what's been happening nationally and, and locally. I mean, these things impact the very soul of, of folks, particularly those that are disproportionately impacted. I would be very naive to say that there's not some institutional racism across the country, especially within the police department. I think that we do need to open our minds and to learn about other cultures. And if you don't, then you're, you're stuck in your ignorance of mankind. Creator put us all on this earth, and Creator is waiting for us to get our act together. Hello, and welcome to Town Hall Seattle. I'm Enrique Cerna of KCTS 9. Documentary filmmaker Ken Burns' latest work is about Jackie Robinson, the man who broke the color line in Major League Baseball. Burns says he is often asked why race plays such a prominent role in many of his films. His answer, race is American history. It is who we are. Burns calls race in America our original sin. Talking about race is difficult, very difficult. It makes people uncomfortable but we need to talk about it, because when it comes to race in our nation, we've got issues. In its Facts About Race in America, the Pew Research Center found that 50% of Americans say racism in our society is a significant problem. That's up from 33% in a survey taken five years ago. The Pew survey also found that 73% of African Americans characterize racism as a major problem. Among Latinos, it's 58%. For whites, 44%. And what about progressive Seattle, where according to the US Census, nearly 70% of the population is white, about 14% Asian, 8% black, and more than 6.5% Latino. How do Seattle residents view race relations here? How progressive is Seattle when it comes to race? Now, we're going to take up those questions and much more with Seattle Mayor Ed Murray and Nikita Oliver, poet, lawyer, and organizer. Also joining us is State Supreme Court Justice Stephen Gonzalez and Marcus Green, the founder and executive director of the South Seattle Emerald. Please give them a warm welcome. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here to talk about this uh, very important topic. And Mr. Mayor, let me begin with you. Um, you have said that, uh, yes, Seattle is a progressive city, but that when it comes to progressiveness and race, that we may think we're more progressive than we really are. How so? Well, as you said, I don't think there's a more difficult discussion that we could have in the city or this nation but the issue of race. And the values of the people of this city, I think are values that want to figure out and learn and grow uh, and overcome our racist past. But I think for many folks in, in, in white Seattle, there is a, maybe a lack of sense of just how difficult this conversation is gonna be. And we kind of have a culture that's slightly reserved and I think that holds us back from engaging in the conversation to the extent that we need to engage in the conversation. And often I think when we talk about systems in this city, we forget that we're talking about race. Look at the statistics you just gave for the racial makeup of this city. We're having a pretty heated discussion around homelessness. 
of homeless people in the city of Seattle are African American, compared to about 8% for the entire population of the city. Those are the places where I don't think we're engaging in the discussion to the level that we need to engage in that discussion. Why are we not? Well, I think, you know, I, I, I've jokingly said that Seattle is the most conservative liberal place in America. We are very liberal, but there's maybe sometimes a resistance to that we need to challenge our own orth orthodoxy. And I include myself in this. And that, quite honestly, the fact that we are having a discussion about Black Lives Matter is because somewhere along the way, at the end of the 60s, that discussion dissipated. And I think we thought we were done. And if the Black Lives Matter movement has done anything, it is to remind the rest of the country that the, while we made progress, what is left to be done is almost as great as what was accomplished. Nikita Oliver. Um, you have some fans here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> If, if you have not heard her perform uh, spoken word, or she, uh, her poetry, uh, she's pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, um, your view on this. Uh, and for, yeah. First of all, I want to say peace to the humanity that's in the room. I want to acknowledge all that you're here. Uh, you know, I think, thank you, Mayor, for bringing up Black Lives Matter. I think that's actually... Uh, Black Lives Matter in Seattle is a great example of why uh, I think Seattle's progressiveness only goes as far as policy and not really as far as actual impact for those groups that are disenfranchised uh, in Seattle but also in the nation as a whole. I say that because my experience as a, as a black liberation organizer and as someone who has been to numerous Black Lives Matter protests and served as um, legal support for protesters, I have not only watched the response from Seattle Police Department towards those protesters be not just uh, about policing the protests, but escalated, coming out from jump in riot gear, uh, macing people within 30 to 45 minutes of a protest starting, a protest that's really just marching. What, what we've been doing, what we have a First Amendment right to do uh, for years, hundreds of years. Uh, and I think that this is where we struggle in Seattle. We are all about conversation and talk. In fact, we talk about race all the time. Uh, and I think that's as far as it goes. It doesn't actually translate into real impact or real change for black and brown folks or even poor folks or queer folks, uh, but it's, it's a lot of lip service. We have a race and social justice initiative that says by 2017, let me see if I have these goals here. By 2017, we will ensure racial equity in city programs and services to make tangible differences in people's lives, work with community-based organizations to support the movement to end structural racism, to help lead regional and national networks for racial equity through partnerships with, the, with other governments and institutions, the private sector and philanthropy. What I've seen in my experience as a part of Black Lives Matter movement is not simply escalatory practices by Seattle Police Department, but also the unnecessary and unfounded prosecution of protesters. There's a case that just recently got kicked out of court, got thrown out of court because um, they found prosecutorial misconduct and the fact that they were continuing to prosecute a protester from Martin Luther King 2015. So that says to me that not only is our, our voice not valued and our protest not valued around Black Lives Matter, but in fact, there is an attempt by the city, by the municipality, to squelch that, to repress it, to oppress it by scaring us with prosecution. And so I think we give a lot of lip service to race and social justice. Yeah. Well, let me turn, and I will give the mayor an opportunity to respond to that, but I, I wanted to get in the, the other uh, couple of folks here that are with us. And uh, Steve Gonzalez, uh, Justice Steve Gonzalez, your, your take. Well, I, I'm here, uh, and I sit on the state Supreme Court. So my view is the entire state, as well as the city of Seattle, where, where I live. And what's interesting to me is what's happening nationally and how we're talking about how we get along with each other. And one of the important parts of our Constitution, and this is part of civics education, which unfortunately is neglected these days, is talking about the 13th and 14th Amendments to our U.S. Constitution, passed 148 years ago. And the 13th Amendment said that uh, slaves can't be enslaved. People who were formerly enslaved are free. 
And our Constitution said otherwise. It said that blacks were three-fifths of a person. And the 14th Amendment uh, said that if you're born in the U.S., even if your ancestors are African-American or anyone else, you can be a citizen. That is birthright citizenship, which has now been the law of the land for almost 150 years. So when I hear people questioning that as if that's a new turn of events and maybe we need to revisit it, I want us to consider what we would be going back to. We would be going back to the construction era. We would be going back to the era where blacks' lives were up in the air. Their status was controlled by Dred Scott, uh, which, which said that they could never be citizens. That right, this discussion of anchor babies, I think, uh, is really destructive to us all getting along with each other. And I want us to think back about those two amendments to the Constitution and what important redemptive steps those were in this nation and how important they are. They also included, uh, by the way, the due process and equal protection clauses in the 14th Amendment, bedrock principles in our democracy. Marcus Green. I guess my mom's not here, so I don't get claps for me, but... Um, <laughs> what do you, you want to compete with there, Nikita here? Is that the deal? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, it, it is hard to claim that we are a progressive city when the fact is we live in a segregated city. Um, Seattle is the epitome. If it was uh, epitomized by a person, it would be that uh, person at the dinner table who has a you know, a hunk of spinach stuck in their teeth, and they do not want to tell you, they do not want you to tell them that that, 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 that hunk is there to get it out. Um, we have had this issue for hundreds of years in, in Seattle. Um, I remember Newt Berger, or Skip Berger, who's here uh, from Crosscut, he told me, shared with me a letter from residents of uh, South and Central Seattle when, you know, black people and people of color, they were concentrated. Um, hugely in that area, as, as they are now, at least in the, the Central District. And it was the same thing to, to the mayor's office and to the city council of uh, our concerns are not met. And any time that you segregate and isolate a, um, a subsection of a population, whether that is intentional or whether that is just happenstance, um, you also isolate and segregate their concerns and their opinions and their thoughts and their ideas and that it continues to happen today. And I realize that we as a city continue to speak to race, continue to say um, that we get it. But these are things that, you know, mayors were saying in the 1970s and Mayor Murray's predecessor said and, Mayor, and the predecessor for, for him said and so on and so forth. So I think um, that the only conversation is worth, that is worth really having is not that... Um, you know, how progressive are we? Are we progressive enough? It's identifying that, no, we are not meeting the needs and we are not fulfilling the promises for many in this city. And how do we do that? That is the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. How do we get there? I mean, we are living in a city that is, what are we, we're the third fastest growing city, aren't we, mm -hmm. in the country? Mm -hmm. We have an economic boom going on here. Mm -hmm. But yet we also know that uh, that's a great thing to have. And as a mayor, you've got to be very happy about that. But the challenge also is, is that um, we have gentrification happening. We have uh, people being pushed out of the city. Uh, we have people unable to afford to live in the city. How can you change that? I think the last point is a very, very important point. We put together an um, uh, uh, affordable housing group, better known as HALA, and one of the recommendations was that Seattle needed to address the racist nature of our housing. Not that currently people are making decisions, or the government is, but if you look at a map of redlining and you look at a map today of Seattle, if you look at a map of covenants, from the 1930s and you look at map of Seattle today, they're basically the same. This is a city that has remained fairly segregated by neighborhood. What was interesting is the Hollow Group had the courage and the council had the courage to step up and say, this is something we need to address. And we were immediately hammered in the media for accusing folks of being racist. So that's one of the most difficult discussions we're, we're, we're dealing with here. We have to own up, and we could talk about police issues, and I hope we have a chance to do that. Because again, we're dealing with a historical context here. And if we don't address the historical context, we cannot move forward. 
When it comes to the issue uh, of, uh, of affordable housing, um, the city has put a proposal on the table that would create more affordable housing than any city in America. And the pushback is pretty significant. And it usually involves the discussion around loss of single family neighborhoods. And part of that is a fear of, oh my God, we're just gonna plow the city under, which is not the recommendations of HALA. But the fear is also that somehow the character of those neighborhoods will change. And our single family neighborhoods are mostly white. So if we want affordable housing, if we want to address gentrification, that means a diversification of how our neighborhoods look in the type of housing stock we have in them. That is going to be a pretty difficult discussion that we have between now and 2017. Go ahead. So just, just a little historical context about uh, housing in Seattle. So we did have racialized housing covenants uh, prior to Shelley v. Kramer, which eventually said those are unconstitutional and they were no longer allowed to be enforced by law, but they were enforced by private contract between people. Uh, around, uh, prior to the 1940s, somewhere around in there, uh, Seattle got its first uh, public housing. And even though black folks had been confined to the Central District, uh, as we know it now, which was just 10 census tracts of Seattle, it was the only place where black people could get any property or find housing. And so the Seattle Housing Authority thought itself so progressive because they did not have segregated public housing. But what they did have was a quota. They could only allow so many black people to live there, even though black folks were the ones least likely to find housing in the city. So I bring that up because, um, and I'm not a mathematician or anything, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> yes, that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> but I, I looked at Hala and wanted to understand better what it meant. And as I did a little bit of digging, I, I found that not only does the discussion with the single family zoning need to happen about uh, what, what, how those areas need to change, but there's actually not been a lot of push on those areas to change them because they're pushed back was we don't want those people here, they will make our neighborhoods less viable. And so what that meant was we've moved to this concept of urban villages. And so HALA then uh, means that of the, the highest cost housing that's built, 7% of that has to go to affordable housing, has to be made into affordable housing, or they have to pay into the linkage fee. Uh, of the middle range, 6%, of the lower range, 5%. And that's based on a 60% median income of Seattle. Now, if the median income of Seattle is $70,200, uh, but the, and that's as of 2013, but the black African American income is, median income is $25,700. In order to get that housing at the 60%, you would have to make almost $45,000 a year. Now, even if you get $13 an hour, or eventually the 15 now, you're only making about $31,200 a year if you work every single day that you're able to work. None of us do that. We get sick, family needs things, things happen. So reality is, well, the policy looks progressive, it sounds progressive on paper, the impact doesn't actually serve the people who need it most, which is people of color and low, low wage folks in our city. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't create the outcome that we most need and it does not make white people or wealthy people be uncomfortable. In fact, white and wealthy people get to continue to dictate what the policy looks like and black and brown folks and poor folks still have to be the ones that sacrifice in order to allow this city to have the equilibrium of comfort that it's had for over 100 years. So, can I, can I, yeah. so I actually have to disagree a bit. We have identified 20,000 affordable in units that we need, including at the very low end. That would be triple what we're doing today. And by the way, San Francisco is trying to do what Seattle's doing today, which would be triple what they're doing. So basically six times what San Francisco is doing today. 6,000 of those are through the multi, uh, through the uh, inclusionary uh, upzone. The other parts of it include doubling the housing levy, uh, which will create housing for the lowest income people. And again, that is not a done deal. And I think it's worth reminding folks that a, a whole raft of advocates 
uh, immigrant organizations, uh, advocacy for people of color, civil rights groups, have signed on to HALA because it is, in America, the most aggressive affordable housing, including at the very low, low end. I want to mention here that uh, for uh, those of you that are uh, viewing us right now via our streaming, uh, you can also get into the conversation by sending us a tweet, uh, the hashtag Race Matters. And for those of you here in the audience that might want to ask a question or make a comment, you can step up here by me and I will work you into the conversation. So, Mr. Mayor, um, so, you know, we come back, and I think all of you weigh into this. Uh, I think we're getting to the point here, too, where when we talk about the issues of race, we're also talking about inequality and, and, and the, the lack of the fact that, that not everybody's making the same amount of money. Not everybody has the same opportunity to, to afford to live in Seattle. Uh, and that's changing the makeup of this city. Uh, it's great when we look and we see all the Amazonians downtown and what that means for the... For the economic base of the city. But again, what is happening to the demographic of the city? It seems to be changing, and for people of color, maybe that, that, that isn't a good thing. Well, and, and so we have to be fairly proactive, and again, I think in, a, in, in two short years, uh, from, going, from going to not having an affordable housing strategy to having an aggressive one, from being the first city in America to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, and by the way, the majority of minimum wage workers in this city are, are people of color. Uh, by taking a summer youth employment program that had 600 and got it to 2,000 last summer, and we're on our way to 4,000 this summer, by having a priority hire program that we can now actually say, we will hire you if you live in a neighborhood that is economically distressed, which as we had the discussion just a minute ago about how we're segregated, is mostly communities of color. If it's a city project, you're now going to get hired um, on that project. Those are just a few of the things we are trying to do uh, to make this, this, this gentrification issue one that Seattle can turn the tables on and say, you can grow and you can grow affordably, something we haven't done to this point. Can I just throw an idea out there? Very quickly, because I want I'll to I'll throw it out here. quickly. Okay. We were also the first city in the United States to voluntarily integrate if you look at our schools, our schools are also still incredibly segregated. Being the first city to do something doesn't make us progressive. It might make us preemptive, but it doesn't make us progressive. And so I think we really need to consider, we're progressive as to what? Does being first at something actually mean that we've done it right? Or does it mean we've just done something to say we did something and it, even if it's not effective? Okay. Question. You know, and, and, yes. and I, guess, I guess when we're raising the minimum wage as the first in the nation, we're doing that because we challenge the rest of America to do it. And now cities all around America are doing it, LA, New York, San Francisco. We led the way, folks. We can model for the rest of the country how we can get this right. I think that integrating people who would otherwise be pushed out of the system or the city is really important. So affordable housing is an important step, and it does seem very progressive. However, we're not changing the problem, and the problem is the belief system and the values that people have uh, for people of color. So if we were to put a person like me, and let's just say I was not educated, I would never be able to get a paying job to be able to sustain my quality of life at a decency, then I get put into this low-income housing where there's other rich people around me, we haven't actually achieved diversity because I'm not included. Not only can I not afford to be a part of my society, my society doesn't want me in there and thinks that I would be the problem. So all we're doing is putting a people of color into predominantly white places, making their life harder without actually resolving the underlying issue. Come on. Come on. Any reaction to that? How do you react? Okay. I have a reaction to the idea about Seattle's progressiveness. Uh, we are pretty proud of ourselves, uh, and I think I, I put myself in the same category of thinking that we're more progressive than perhaps we are. We've seen that Yakima, for example, has just hired or just elected its first Latina. 
And, and, that's, and that's great. And it took a lawsuit to get there, but that's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if we look at ourselves for a moment as we contemplate that, we've also just elected the very first Latina on our city council in the history of Seattle. So we're, we're not better than Yakima on that measure. We're the same. We're just the same. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, to, the, to the justice's point, right? I mean, if you look across the board on disparities in, in the city, I mean, as much as we want to trumpet who we are and, and, and that we are living this bastion of uh, uh, this progressive bastion, uh, a lot of the disparities with, with people of color are no better than somewhere that you find in the Deep South in terms of employment, in terms of education, in terms of incarceration. So it's not what, to me, it is not what you call yourself, it is what you are. And, and I think going to your point earlier about having a difficult discussion, uh, I think those of us who represent institutions tend to get defensive and defend our institutions. And I think that can shut down the conversation. I, I know a senior colleague of mine who likes to talk about the glass being half full, and that 40 years ago when he became a lawyer, there weren't women, there weren't people of color, and anybody who was gay or lesbian was in the closet. And now the glass is half full. My reaction to that is, are you saying then that I should stop working? Because for me, until the glass is running over, we can't rest. And so the glass has to be running over. Half full is not good enough. And I think, I think that's, because, that's because our idea of being progressive is not... So the word progressive means happening or developing gradually or in stages, proceeding step by step. It is this investment, really, in incremental change. And it's the idea that so long as people are suffering less, like we've done a little bit to chip away at the suffering of disenfranchised groups, then we must be progressive because we've done something. I don't want to be progressive if that's what that means. What I want to be is radically transformative because it means you've gone to the root of the cause and said, instead of just simply chipping away at the problem and lessening the little bit of suffering, like we have less suffering than Mississippi is. We're more progressive than Mississippi. I don't want that standard. What I want to know is that we've alleviated all of the suffering. And what that requires in a city like Seattle, where you have a lot of wealthy white people, is actually those wealthy white people doing more than simply saying progressive things and maybe sort of investing in progressive policies, but being willing to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Because we need a real redistribution of wealth, access, and equity in this city that allows black and brown people and also poor people, and I want to recognize the Duwamish because we're on their land and they're still a federally recognized tribe. If, if we don't redistribute resources in a city that is economically thriving, a city where every year as um, rent increases at $100, 15% more people become houseless. We have to really start dealing with what race and equity means as it pertains to economics and how do we really redistribute resources. It means white folks got to get uncomfortable. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, how do we make you uncomfortable? I mean, or, or how do we make white people uncomfortable? How do you respond to that? How do you respond? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. I, I, <laughs> No, I didn't hear your question. I, I said, how do we make white people uncomfortable? Uh, and, and you put no, Nikita how, on a How do you respond to that? <laughs> yeah, besides sticking uh, Nikita to, the, to, a, to a party and having her talk about it. How do we make, how do we move and, 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 and I guess make some change here so that we are so, making? You know, and we need to be uncomfortable because we have some real problems. Let me take an area where we just don't want to have this discussion as a progressive city. The graduation rates for African Americans in this city, whether graduating on time or graduating at all, are bad, and they haven't changed in 20 years. But we don't have that discussion during school board elections, and we don't have that discussion at all about outcomes in our school district. Um, the last time we had an education summit in this city was 26 years ago under Norm Rice. We're about to have another one that I'm going to be conducting on April 30th. But are we willing to have an uncomfortable discussion that, yeah, we've got great schools, we've got great teachers, but when you peel everything else away, economics, uh, geography, we're stuck. And we're stuck particularly when it comes to African Americans and outcomes. It's a very uncomfortable discussion that the city hasn't had. And I keep quoting these statistics over the last two years that I've been mayor, 
And I, it's almost like a tree falling in the forest. I never see it reported in the media. But no. the fact is, jobs are being created in the city, and people are pouring into this city to get those jobs. They are not always the kids who are coming out of our own school system. And that, if you want to get uncomfortable about what we can change as a city, there's things about our tax system that the, the state and the feds, we, we need help to change those things. But our school system, we actually could do something about. Talking Question. about the school system, and I'll be very short. The, the mayor has alluded to some of it needing state change. Let me read section, Article 9, Section 1, the preamble to that section in our state constitution. It says, quote, it is the paramount duty of the state to make ample provision for the education of all children residing within its borders. And this is the part that gets left off often when it's quoted. Without distinction or preference on account of race, color, caste, or sex. If we're talking about being progressive, this state put this language, the strongest language in the nation, into our state constitution back when we were founded. We're failing to live up to it. And what I want to point out in that language is it doesn't say it's the legislature's job or the governor's job or the Supreme Court job. It says it's the state's paramount duty. And the state is all of us. All right. Question. Yeah, I'm a, a parent and a former co-PTA president at Thurgood Marshall Elementary in the Central District. Um, Thurgood Marshall, as you're aware, was the first black Supreme Court justice um, of the United States. And the school that's named after him in the Seattle school district is the most segregated school mm -hmm. in, in probably the state. Um, it has a, a HCC program, which is a self-selecting program, which is um, primarily affluent white families from uh, Capitol Hill, Madrona, McGilvra, Madison Park, who self-select into a program that places their kids two years ahead. Um, and the remainder is the what's called the gen ed population, or the gen ed program, which is neighborhood kids. There's also a portion of kids who, uh, in the Peace Academy. It was the, I think, the African American Academy before the HCC program split out of Lowell and moved into that school. Um, at that time, it was a Title I school. Um, with, the, with the shifting demographic from this program that people self-select into, um, the demographic has now changed, and this school no longer qualifies for Title I funding. So you have an HCC program that is protected by state law that receives additional funding, that's white affluent families. And then you have a community that, was, that, that, that would by all rights qualify for Title I funding and now no longer receive that. How do we justify that? How do we say that that's okay? They, they self-select in, they test in, if they don't like the school district results, they can appeal and they can pay a private, a private psychologist to test them and then get into this program. And it, and it, injures, it injures low income people and, and primarily African American people. And not only Thurgood Marshall, but Washington Middle School and Garfield, or Garfield High School. You know, I, I think, sort of get some response. I think schools are one of the best examples in this city of why we're not very progressive. Originally, Schools at one point in time in this city, like they are now, I believe it was prior to the 1960s, were based upon what neighborhood you lived in. So since black folks were confined to the Central District, uh, black folks mostly ended up going to schools in the Central District. Then the voluntary racial transfer program went into play. It was the school's attempt to try to get more black students to leave the Central District, which some did, but very few white students decided to go to school in the schools in the Central District. So a series of cases done by the NAACP and community members then led to the forced uh, desegregation of Seattle Public Schools. And it, it ended up with the busing program that we had prior to 2007. So when the parents involved in community schools case went all the way up to the Supreme Court, it meant that we no longer could use the racial tiebreaker. And it also meant that we had to go back to the neighborhood schooling model that, pri that prior to the change actually had us in segregated schools uh, by fact, even though it wasn't by law. So the reason I say that the schools are a great example of why we are full progressive, who pushed for that change? It was white parents who did not say that they didn't want black kids to go to their schools. It was white parents who said they didn't want their kids to go to primarily black and brown schools. And I think one way that white people can get uncomfortable is one, not litigate cases like parents involved in community schools, but the second is to 
really deal with the biases that we have about around black and brown people. The idea that black and brown children are not as smart as yours, or not as behaved as yours, or will make it so your child doesn't get the education you think they deserve, and stop moving them to schools and, and building, building predominantly white schools. So I think parents involved in community schools, if you don't know about the case, go Google it. The Google is a wonderful tool. Um, <laughs> was really a great example of how Seattle really isn't that progressive and white people honestly don't want to be around black and brown peoples, which goes back to my brother's point here where he said, we become not simply a marginalized and disenfranchised community, but an isolated community whose concerns are not heard because we didn't litigate that case. All right, let me turn to my brother, the mayor, to have a response here. <laughs> so, an absolutely great point, and the question that was asked, is this right? And when I bring that question up, what I immediately get, and it comes from the left, is, Mayor, you're trying to take over the school district. But, because the school district in the city is a separate governance than the city government, so we don't control the school district. So the question is, how can we let that happen in the city? So if you don't want the council and the mayor to take over, over the school district, if we want to get at that question and that example, we have to have an honest discussion about how we're going to change our school district, which probably means governance has to change as well as the funding formulas, including what the city puts in. The city took a big step under Norm Rice with the family and education levy, but that by itself is not changing these underlying issues. Uh, the programs that he mentioned are programs that if we want to change them, it means we have to change how our school district is governed. And that doesn't mean I'm trying to take over the school district. I mean, I have a few problems as it is. Um, <laughs> But together, I think we should engage in this conversation that we're going to begin on April, on April 30th and carry on for about six months about how do we answer the question that he brought up. Okay, I want to change gears here a bit. Uh, and I want to talk about the police department. And I want to talk about uh, has um, we, the department is under a consent decree, but has there been progress in the department and communities of color bridging the gap of distrust? Some. Some. You don't take decades of institutional racism. You don't take decades of a certain type of policing. You don't take centuries of mistrust between policing authorities and communities of color and change that overnight. When I came into office, the city was fighting with the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department. We were put under a consent decree. I made a commitment that we would cooperate. We are getting some of the reports back now from the federal monitor and the federal court and the U.S. attorney that says we are making progress. But this change is not going to happen overnight, and it is not going to be easy. What do you hear in South Seattle? No, I would just say, the mayor said some, I would say that it's being charitable. Um, yeah, with all due respect, I, I mean, uh, the, the mayor uh, happened to speak with me at a MLK Day celebration um, held at Mount Zion Church. And that day, I remember he uh, asked the African Americans to stand up. And then he asked the police force to stand up. And he said, uh, you guys need to talk to each other. And I may be paraphrasing, Mr. Mayor, but... And I just remember the reaction of the community afterwards, of the black community afterwards. It was like, we have tried to talk. We have tried to speak. We have tried to say all that we can say. And there is no trust there anymore. And for trust to be installed, it has to do more than hiring 200 police uh, officials, or excuse me, 200 new uh, police officers. A report has come out saying, yeah. recommending that right, these right. 200 more officers be hired. But, but Mayor Murray did say in, his, in your State of the City address that you would hire, that it was your plans to hire 200 more, correct, sir? Over a long period of time. Right. Because new cops tend to be the cops who, who have issues where right. we get into trouble. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I don't mean to interrupt, but I mean, no. seriously, folks, it's, 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 I don't think that is a laughing matter. This is a, we have a fairly small police force for a city of this size, but if we ramp up too fast, we're going to find ourselves in trouble. We don't want to be in trouble. The, the, the thing is not, 
But here's the thing. Well, in, it's, you know, in further trouble. Excuse but here me. is the thing. It's, it's not just to hire the 200 police officers. It's to hire 200 police officers that have a training in uh, the escalation tactics that are... <laughs> that are accountable to the communities that... They it's not enough... It is not enough to... Uh, tout that you 30% of new hires will be African American. If if the case if the problem was solved just since, uh, essentially from a racial democracy in the police force, then hell, then the Baltimore Police Department would be uh, a model of police reform. <laughs> it is not. It has to go deeper. Mr. Mayor, let me ask you this. Um, obviously, you know, this recommendation of trying to hire that, that many police departments. I mean, police officers got to find money to be able to do that as well. Right. Uh, but should there not be an effort to put a, to hire officers of color to make a difference? Yes, and, and actually um, the most recent recruitment class was the largest um, number of people of color that have been brought into the police force. The number, I believe, was around 30%. Uh, so again, it is, it is step by step. And they don't just get that training that the Justice Department is requiring when they start but they get it every few years. Um, and it's not just about training. The, the points you make are, are very good. Um, and that trust is not gonna be built easy and it's not gonna be built overnight. And it's not simply going to be about training by itself. It's gonna be about actually, you know, and I realize that, you know, you said the trust wasn't there. I have a short time to have this job. Mayors of Seattle's don't last very long. Um, <laughs> but in this short time, if I can move that conversation forward, I have got to try. I have got to try. Because the issue of policing, the issue of race and policing is core to what we're talking about in this country. And I have spent a lot of time as of some really good folks uh, in the city and on the council and the police department trying to listen to hear how we get this right. But again, it is not happening overnight. I think it's a great conversation to have, and it's important that we're having it. And sometimes how you phrase the question really leads to good conversation or derails it. And when we talk about restoring faith and confidence, I think we've already started off on the wrong foot. Because in some communities, there wasn't faith and confidence in the first instance, so you can't restore what wasn't there. <laughs> what we've lost, what we've lost, I think, is the bliss of ignorance. That is, in the affluent, comfortable communities who thought everything was fine, now can't turn away for it, from it, or I hope can't, when you see some of the videos that are shown. It means that we're uncomfortable and we need to restore faith in them by creating a system that actually works and build faith that never perhaps existed in the first place. And, and I think, as Marcus pointed out, when you're hit with a baton, it hurts just as much whether the person swinging it is black, white, brown, or otherwise. Cultural competence really is the key and the training of the police force that has been pointed out. Diversity is great, but it only matters if you have culturally competent folks, no matter what color. Right. Just add on to that. I think we don't ever really go far enough talking about the issues of policing. Um, I appreciate you acknowledging that there are communities where there's never trust. We don't ask why was there never trust, because the police force was built out of the slave patrols, historically, to police black people and native people, and, and it's, it's out of a root of us being viewed as property. And in this city, in a lot of ways, black folks and native folks and also Asian communities are viewed as a sort of cultural property and we're policed in that way. We're used for cultural tourism. We stamp Chief Sell's face on our documents and yet the Duwamish remain unrecognized. I think when we talk about issues of policing, we have really got to dig deep into why that distrust exists. Why would I ever want to trust a police officer who my experience of police officers, regardless of black, brown, or white, has been that they're there to police my actions. Now, I know that there are white folks who are like, but, but police officers are here for our safety. When I call them, they come and they help me with my property. When, you know, like, and that's very real for you. But my experience of police has never been that. And I'm light-skinned, I'm an attorney, I have education. So, and these are all things that we say make people valuable, right? 
I think the next question we have to ask ourselves is why do we still not view other people as human enough to hear their experiences and their stories, their encounters with police, enough to say we're going to invest in far more than incremental changes when it comes to the police force, but we will disarm them. If you're one of the 200 cops that signed on to that lawsuit that were opposed to the consent decree, you're going to go because clearly you want to use force. I, want, I, I need to move. So more questions I just want here. to say we have to we have to dig deeper. All right. Yeah. Yeah. First, I want to say thank you for uh, everyone for coming, and I do agree with them over there about trusting the police. We tried everything. We tried Dr. King slash civil rights. We tried Malcolm X, Nation of Islam, and also we tried Huey P. Newton, Black Panther Party. Black Panther Party was a self defense, but they still did good. They abide by their Second Amendment, but they still did good because they were being aware of police brutality. But history keeps repeating itself. Today, we have a new movement, Black Lives Matter movement, okay? All Lives Matter is just a hashtag, which is trying to subvert to the Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is talk it up, but you back it up by marching out there, okay? And secondly, I wanna say is, um, how can we trust these cops? Because if you think of, uh, the uh, NWA, they say F the uh, police, right? But there was, there was context to it. Uh, Rodney King, right, it was put on, on, on video camera. He got beat up. Here she keep repeating herself. Eric Garner, okay, he got chokehold, right? He said, I can't breathe 10 times. But then, but then there was a dude up in South Carolina, right, uh, charged in church shooting. Shot and killed nine people. He, afterwards, they gave him a vest and said, hey, I want me a cheeseburger. So you tell me they're going to listen to him, but then they won't listen to uh, Aaron Garner because he's big and black, right? Is white privilege real? Is that the example of white privilege? That's all I'm asking. That's all I'm asking. Eric? Uh, my question is about uh, education. I mean, I heard you talk about the levy. I'm not going to talk about police issues because uh, Nikita is doing a good job on that piece. So I'll let her have that tonight. Um, I've been here for 40 years, and we've been talking about the education uh, I, I gap. When I moved here 40 years ago, black people was running things. I mean, they had the Central Area School Council uh, uh, and things like that. And over the years, uh, we had the campus preschool program that sent kids to preschool and first grade ahead. We had the Head Start program. All those programs was disbanded for the levy. And uh, what we would want to see is an audit of that money for the last 26 years because it's been a lot of money that's been spent, a lot of taxes been used, people tax themselves. And the gentleman was talking now back there, he was talking about the IPP program. Um, my kids were smart. But they could never get into that program. One of my kids did, uh, but they were absolutely smarter than the program, is how I taught them. <laughs> See, that program is just for people who think their kids are smart. But I taught my kids to believe that they were smarter than that program, so they didn't need to be in that program. But there's 1,500 students in that program, uh, uh, and they have a lot of power. Uh, they exercise power. So my point is that if it's an achievement gap, uh, it's in a gap that is really part of the consciousness of teachers, the consciousness of people who don't believe that the children can learn. We pr applaud the Education Summit, but uh, it's going to take more than that. It's going to take a will to believe that all children uh, can learn and that they have an opportunity. If, if we give them an opportunity, uh, they can all be geniuses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> running, uh, running a little tight on time here on our broadcast portion of this, and uh, I'd like uh, to get a little bit of a wrap-up from each of you. I, I, this conversation is, is a tough one because there is so much that needs to be discussed. But Mr. Mayor, I'm going to give you that opportunity to, uh, you know, where do we go from here? Well, so thank you for this conversation, and, and actually, this is a t very type of exchange um, that I want to be part of. And the last, the last uh, speaker, the Reverend, brought up the issue of we need to look at what we're doing with our, our, our schools. I'm happy to be part of that discussion. I think the council's happy to be part of that discussion. I'm happy to approach the school district with the community. On police, we want to get this right. Uh, you know, no mayor or council member uh, uh, has a background in policing. Well, usually they don't. I don't. And uh, we want to get this right. 
but it's, it's not going to be easy. We need to be challenged. This has been a very challenging conversation, but, but I enjoyed it. You know, the, the, the arc of this has to be that we see each other too. And that nothing, well, nothing is relative to everything. You know, we don't want to say this cause is relative to this cause. The experience of anti-Semitism is the same as African-Americans' experience of anti-Catholicism or my experience uh, growing up in this city as, as a gay person is not the same. But if we don't see each other in each other's experiences, I don't know how we're going to be able to move forward. Nikita? Uh, wrapping up what cannot be wrapped up, I think that black and brown folks have been asking to be seen for a long time. And we tell our stories and we're often met with, well, I'd like to see the data, or I, I don't see it that way, I've never experienced that. And what I think would begin to turn the tide is one, I think white folks really have got to dig into their internalized white supremacy. The identity that has allowed us to think subconsciously we are better than someone else. I think the second thing is we have to learn to accept people's stories and experiences for what they are. I see a lot of community organizers in this room and there are a lot of changes that have been made in Seattle, not because the city wanted to make them, but because grassroots community organizers said we will not be silent until we are heard. I would like to see I would like to see us not have to push so hard to be heard because often when we have to do that, we get denigrated. We get told we speak too loud or we speak too much. And so I think one way the city can really make some changes is the moment community rises up and says to you, here's our experience, here's what's happening to us to be responsive to the solutions that we bring forth. Right. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for convening this discussion and for the mayor to be willing to have it and for everyone else on the panel to be willing to talk about it. And I want to try to model something, and that is that we first have to admit that our own institutions have problems. And there are two institutions in the law that I want to point out that have big problems. One is we're trying to build a new juvenile facility that has a jail involved. And the community's reaction to it and pressure has made that better and will result in a better outcome. And as much as people say, well, we're doing all these great things, we're doing them in part because of you, because you're involved, you care, and you're paying attention. So please, keep helping the law be better at what it does. And second, we're producing lawyers. We're producing lawyers. We have one public law school in this state, the University of Washington. And what does it do? What it does is, much like other universities across the nation, is it looks at LSAT scores as one of the major measures about who gets in. And what does the LSAT measure? More accurately, the income of your parents than your aptitude in law. So, as a, as a result of chasing the US News and World Report rankings, we bring in, with Nikita, a bright example to the contrary. We bring in a largely homogenous class who, when they get out, either don't care about serving low or moderate income kids or, or people, or can't afford to because of a crushing debt. Unless we change the very model of our public institutions and make them accountable to all of us, we're just going to perpetuate this with every generation that follows. Marcus. Got to let him talk. Got to let him talk. Yeah. Well, I know we're running low on time, and I, the, the judge and Nikita and the mayor are a bit tough act to follow. So I just, I guess I'll, I'll leave you with, my, uh, with words that my mother always tells me. And, and I love you, Mama. Um, no, but she said that in this world that is cruel and is unjust and is unfair and will never be perfect, in this world that bestows advantages on people because of skin color, because of gender, because of class, because of race, that in this world it is not your fault that you were born into it as it is. It is 100% your fault if you leave it that way when you depart from this world. So, my challenge to you today, because this won't be the last forum on race I'm sure you go to, <laughs> right, it probably wasn't the first, 
is that instead of this being group therapy where we engage in some collective <laughs> catharsis, to leave actually with a question of what are you going to do? What am I going to do? Am I part of this problem? Then how can I be part of the solution? Thank you. All right. Well said, well said, well said. Well, that brings us uh, to an end of our broadcast portion of this conversation. And let me say thank you to our panel. Uh, please give them a round of applause. We appreciate it. Thank you to the mayor, Ed Murray, Nikita Oliver, State Supreme Court Justice Steve Gonzalez, and the South Seattle kid, Marcus Green. And also thank you to all of you that uh, helped us put on this uh, conversation, and that is especially to Town Hall Seattle. Thank you for providing such a great venue. We really appreciate it very much. And also uh, to Seattle City Club, we appreciate you being here and giving us the uh, help that you have, and to the Seattle Channel. And with that, I'm Enrique Cerna. We'll see you next time. Thank you all, and good night.